Siege warfare exists the world over, involving the use of big wooden machines, such as trebuchants, to launch flaming payloads at enemy strongholds, whether that's in the west or in the east. And after you've bombarded your enemy's stronghold with flaming balls, next you need to scale the walls and get inside. And this existed as much in China as it did in the West. In fact, in China, they were really fans of the whole flaming balls thing. Sometimes with balls coming out of nowhere, attacking from all sides, destroying everything in their path. Anyway, Ancient and Imperial China did have a wide variety of siege weapons, from the trebuchant, which is a type of catapult, to battering rams, to gate-blocking contraptions, and different types of ladders for scaling walls. This is Chinese Siege Weapons Explained, Part 1, Catapults and Trebuchants. So let's start with the most common siege weapon, whether it is in the east or the west, the trebuchet, or trebuchon, if you want to use the French pronunciation, which is also used in British English, <laughs> is a type of large catapult that uses the physics of leverage and a sling to give the payload more velocity. Many types of early trebuchons and other siege weapons were developed during the Warring States period, where small states had a kind of arms race between each other. The first ever recorded use of what is called a traction trebuchon anywhere in the world was actually in China in the 4th century BC, recorded in chapter 14 and 15 of the Mo Jing. Now the word for catapult or trebuchon in Chinese is pao. Notice it's written with the stone radical on the left as opposed to this very similar character with the fire radical on the left, which is also pronounced pao, which means a cannon which the Chinese also had at various times in history. Although this may be confusing since the stones launched by these trebuchons were often on fire too. Anyway, the first trebuchets or trebuchants and catapults in China were based on the idea of leverage and counterbalance. The Chinese first figured this idea out when doing things like scooping water out of a river or well. You could get leverage on a stick by pulling on the short end of a stick that was balanced on another stick and that would make it easier for you to hoist heavy loads like buckets of water on the long end of the stick. In the book, Chinese Siege Warfare, Mechanical Artillery and Siege Weapons of Antiquity and Illustrated History, there is a story about Zi Gong, one of the disciples of Confucius, who was traveling the country and he came across an old man who wasn't using one of these contraptions to gather water to irrigate his fields. Zi Gong asked why, and the old man said that it was a cunning contraption, and those who use cunning contraptions have cunning in their hearts. And it's actually a beautiful story if you are talking in terms of Chinese spirituality, giving up the little tricks that emerge out of competition for worldly gain. But for those who weren't trying to become enlightened Taoist sages, this was exactly the kind of cunning that was needed to conquer all of China. So this idea of leverage was quickly turned into a weapon. Here is an image of what an early design may have looked like. A team of men would pull down on the ropes coming from the short end, and that would cause the long end of the stick to travel at a faster speed since it would have to cover greater distance because the circumference of its circular arc would be greater. It is similar to the idea of bicycle gears where turning a small cog, which is linked by a chain to a larger cog, creates ease of movement to ride up a hill. Pulling on the short end of the stick meant you could easily hurl a heavy load with the large end. This was the most basic type of trebuchon, and this evolved into something called the xuanfeng pao, or the whirlwind trebuchon. You have this short end, and then your payload would be hurled on this long end, and the whole thing could swivel 360 degrees. There are many illustrations of these trebuchons in the book Wu Jing Zong Yao, or the complete essentials for the military classics, which is like an encyclopedia of Chinese weapons written in the Song Dynasty around 1040 AD. They came in different varieties, some with small bases that would have the bottom of the catapult dug a few feet into the ground for stability, and some on wheels. The whirlwind trebuchant was a quick use weapon. The firing arm was easily reloadable after each shot, and you could vary the range by adding or subtracting people who were pulling on the ropes, and it could rotate 360 degrees 
so you could aim it precisely. It lacked the power to take down walls, but it could be used like a sniper rifle for multiple shots at soft targets like enemy infantry. There was even a version with multiple firing arms in the same machine. With this one, the whole mount could swivel 360 degrees and each arm could swivel too. So the whole thing could aim in the direction of an enemy army and then the teams manning each firing arm could target different targets within that army. And as you can see in this image, these trebuchants were even sometimes mounted on ships. Here is one on the roof of what is called a Chuan or tower ship from the Song Dynasty. Now the whirlwind catapult or trebuchant was used for around a thousand years in China. As time went on, there were other types of catapults invented. One of those was the Hu Dun Pao, or Crouching Tiger Catapult, and though that's not the same Crouching Tiger as in Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon. This one featured a larger, more stable frame that could hurl heavier loads, but it could not rotate like the Whirlwind Trebuchon. The Crouching Tiger Trebuchon was still, however, what is called a Traction Trebuchon, which relies simply on a team of guys pulling down on ropes from the short end of the firing arm. There was also something called the Si Jiao Pao, or four foot catapult. And this was another heavy duty one, and it still used the method of pulling down on ropes to fire. But that all changed when the Mongols invaded China. They brought with them something called the counterweight catapult. And guys, before we get into the counterweight catapult, do you want to feel healthy and energetic from the inside out? Well. OptiNourish NAD Plus Optimal is made for you. This physician-made formulated blend contains NR, nicotinamide riboside, with methylation support, antioxidants, and adaptogenic herbs, so your cells can perform at their best and help you feel your best every single day. It also contains many traditional Chinese ingredients like ginseng and goji berries that can help keep your body energetic and your mind alert. I've been taking one every day and I am liking the results. So don't miss out. Click the link below and enter promo code BEN10 at checkout to claim your exclusive 10% discount today. Give your cells the support they need for energy, focus, and long-term wellness. So, these counterweight catapults no longer had a team of guys pulling. They instead relied on a massive weight on the short end of the firing arm to trigger the weapon. They were first used by the invading Mongols at the Battle of Xiangyang, or Xiangyang Zhizhan. The Mongols had laid siege to the city of Xiangyang, but they were at a stalemate. So Kublai Khan personally called on engineers from Persia who had developed the counterweight catapult in the Middle East. They traveled to China and helped the Mongols construct massive counterweight catapults that could hurl 600 pound stones around 1,600 feet or 500 meters. These catapults were strong enough to smash holes in stone walls. The Mongols first used these counterweight catapults to take the city of Fancheng, which is on the opposite side of a river to Xiangyang, and actually in modern times it's just a district of the city of Xiangyang. After taking Fancheng, they turned their attention to Xiangyang itself and started bombarding the city with stones. A message was sent from Xiangyang to the Song Dynasty Emperor for reinforcements, but after hearing how powerful these new weapons were, he considered the city lost and did not send troops. Xiangyang then surrendered. Marco Polo claimed in his book that he taught the Mongols how to build and operate the counterweight catapults. But Muslim sources list the names of the engineers as Talib and his sons, Abu Bakr, Ibrahim, and Muhammad. That is why you see Marco Polo with the Muslim engineers operating the catapults in the Netflix Marco Polo TV series. More counterweight, Talib. Any more weight, the actual More weight. counterweight. I don't know what the truth of this is. Maybe Marco Polo did have something to do with it, but at least Netflix got the name of the engineer right, Talib. This type of catapult in China came to be called Hui Hui Pao, or Muslim catapult. And Song Dynasty China then redesigned its own catapults, such as the Si Jiao Pao and the Hu Dun Pao, to be counterweight catapults. But it was too little, too late. And within six years, the Song Dynasty was over and the Mongols established the Yuan Dynasty on Chinese soil. And that is the story of the weapon that changed China. But it was a story that ended just as quickly as it began. Because the counterweight catapult's time in China was fleeting. And by the time the Ming took back China from the Mongols, 
The gunpowder age was already upon us, and the Ming were using mechanical artillery and cannons instead of catapults. And these great siege weapons faded into obscurity. Guys, if you like this video, please subscribe to the channel. And if you want to go a step further and support the channel as a member for $4.99 a month, do hit that join button down below. You'll get a special badge by your name and your comments will be highlighted for us so we can reply if you ask a question. There's also a link to NAD Plus Optimal below. Get 10% off with the code BEN10. It's a great supplement made with both traditional Chinese and modern Western ingredients. And guys, I also want to tell you about my new channel, China Now, where I'm going to be covering some more contemporary Chinese topics and current events. My first video is here. Uh, you can click on it now if you want. It's all about the video game Wu Chung Fallen Feathers, which was recently accused of self-censoring to appease Chinese nationalist gamers. OK, it's really interesting. Do check it out. That game was also set in the Ming Dynasty that we talked about uh, at the end of this video. And once you've watched it, if you like it, do subscribe. I'll probably do one video a week on that channel as well. Thanks for watching. Let me know what siege weapons you want to see next week. I'll see you next time. Bye bye.